This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. It's my pleasure and it's an honor to be able to introduce K Professor Karis Thompson. But before I introduce her today, I would like to um, talk about the conference that is related to this um, talk. Um, it's a joint conference sponsored by the Science and Technology in the Pacific Century Initiative. This initiative is co-sponsored by the Center for East Asian and Pacific Studies here at the University of Illinois and the East Asian Studies Center at Indiana University. And the conference title is East Asian Bioscience, Transnational Competition and Collaboration. And I believe the, the keynote lecture tomorrow will be given by um, Professor Joan Fujimura of uh, the closing address. Um, at, this is the keynote, I'm sorry. This is the keynote and the closing address by um, Professor Joan Vujimora of the University of Wisconsin and also the Russell Sage Foundation. So, but back to Professor Thompson. Professor Karis Thompson is the professor and chair of gender women's studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, but that's not our only appointment. She's also the interim director of the Beatrice Brain Bain Research Group. This research group is a critical feminist research center that supports and coordinates feminist scholarship across disciplines as well as the director of the Lee Ka Shing Initiative in Gender and Science, which is part of the, um, I believe, just recently finished building um, and center for the Lee Ka Shing Center for Biomedical Health and Sciences, as well as the Associate Director for Science and Technology, Science, Technology and Society Center. Um, and I believe you are the founding director It was bringing together science and technology scholarship, study scholarship across the UC campuses. Um, she is firmly trained in science technology studies, receiving her PhD in science studies from the University of California, San Diego, but um, is also has a BA from St. Anne's College at Oxford University um, in philosophy, psychology, and physiology, received with honors. She has taught at a, various, a variety of the, the best universities in the country. Um, she was um, teaching in the Department of History and the Committee of Women's Studies at Harvard University, the Department of Science Technology Studies at Cornell University and our Fair University of, the, of Illinois. Um, from 1998 to 2000, she was a, a professor in the Department of Sociology and Women's Studies. She has published widely in a variety of forums. Um, her most recent book um, is Making Parents, Reproductive Techno Technologies in Their Ontologic Choreography, published by MIT Press in 2005. It's won the Rachel, Rachel Carson Prize for the Society for the Social Studies of Science um, as the best book in science and technology studies with political import. Um, it's received wonderful reviews. Um, it's been called Innovative, an Innovative Masterpiece, a dream book from scholars like Adele Clark and Marilyn Strathern. And Judith Butler has commented that making parents is a wide-ranging, unprecedented, incisive, and brilliant inquiry, probing and provocative, and bound to change the field for years to come. She has a forthcoming book from MIT Press um, entitled Good Science, Lessons from the End of the Beginning, End of the Beginning of Human Pluripotent Stem Cell Research, and has a manuscript in process called Charismatic Megafauna and Miracle Babies. Um, again, she's published in um, a host of journals from science technology studies, like um, social studies of science, to environmental, environmental values, gender and history, ISIS. Um, recent lectures have been given at Harvard University, Princeton, University of Chicago, Stanford, UCLA, and um, various, other, various other universities around the world. Um, at every university, she's um, taught at, she's received teaching awards at Harvard, um, Berkeley, and um, I believe Cornell. And, but what's most important about her teaching and all the things she's done, um, all the wonderful things I've not said, that I've said notwithstanding, 
Um, every year that she was a professor at the University of Illinois, she was on the list of teachers ranked as excellent by their students, um, which of course um, is a wonderful little tidbit of antidote for our, our, our local environment. Um, so with that said, um, Karis um, Thompson um, will be talking to us on a, the title of her talk is Asian Regeneration, Stem Cell Research and Medical Tourism in Emerging Asian Bioeconomies. Would you please welcome Professor Thompson. Um, good afternoon, um, and thank you, Ray. Thank you, for Professor Fouché, for that um, massively overly generous introduction. Um, I, and thank you to um, Professor Patel for, the, for introducing the series, and also especially thank you to um, Dr. Jennifer Liu for organizing the event that this is part of, um, and for allowing me to step in for Iowa Ong as, the, as this evening's uh, uh, speaker. Um, when she was unable to make it. Um, for me, this is where I came, Illinois is where I came as an assistant professor, so um, it's really lovely to be back. Um, and some of you I know from, from, um, from those days. Uh, in fact, we just walked past our old house, which was, was very nice. Um, okay, so... Get this out. Let's hope that this will... There we go. So um, my talk begins uh, with uh, uh, the fall of 2001, um, where I was um, interviewing, I think, 130 some freshmen for 12 slots in a freshman seminar at Harvard University on um, the new stem cell research. President Bush had just a couple of weeks previously made his announcement that only some kinds of stem cell research were going to be eligible for federal funding in this country. Um, and it became the beginning of the way in which the field was framed for the following decade um, in, in the US. While I was in my office um, doing, conducting these interviews, uh, there was a big furor outside in the halls. People started screaming. Um, there was shouting and running. And everybody ran downstairs. This was in the Science Center, for those of you who know um, where the History of Science offices are at Harvard. Everybody started running downstairs, leaving all the offices' doors ajar, and running down to the rooms downstairs where they had the big screens um, to watch real time as the Twin Towers were falling. So it was the fall of 2001. It was September the 11th. Um, and in some ways, in my mind, those two events became um, in, inextricably linked at that point. Um, so President George W. Bush's 2001 limiting of federal funding for human embryonic stem cell research was greeted by the scientific community as a blow to US international competitiveness and a threat to its supremacy in science. I know there's a way to turn this on. Mm. Never mind. Um, it was still early days in human embryonic stem cell line derivation. The first published lines had only been derived in 1998. Because of the importance of the United States to basic science training and research worldwide, a de facto geopolitics of the frontiers of regenerative medicine and associated struggles for stem cell science research primacy began to emerge, fueling nationalisms and driving fears of brain drains as a number of prominent US stem cell res researchers moved overseas to more permissive regulatory environments. So as everybody's probably aware, the, the grounds of Bush's um, limits on funding, federal funding for stem cell research was the moral quandary as he saw it, and many of his allies saw it, was that embryos had to be destroyed to do human embryonic stem cell research. And that came up against um, right to life politics, the Dickey Wicker Amendment, and, um, and so this was the compromise that he brokered. Stem cell lines that had already been established, in other words, these, the embryos had already been destroyed, could be used and federal funding could be used to um, work with them, but no new embryos were going to be sacrificed under his watch. So that was the compromise that he came up with. A lot of people found that to be very disingenuous, but it also became the symbol for the kind of science wars, for the way in which the right was associated with anti-science sentiment 
and one of the prongs of uh, the Democratic Party became to um, promote rationality, mod modernity, and science around this field of stem cell science. Um, the 22 usable presidential lines, so the lines that were allowed to be funded became known as, colloquially known as the presidential lines, eligible for NIH funding, were derived in all around the world, in fact, some in the US, some in Australia, South Korea, Israel, India, Singapore, and Sweden. So embryonic stem cell research capacity was already fairly widely distributed, enabling many countries to vie for prominence. Several other countries, including notably the United Kingdom, soon also became highly competitive and added high quality lines to the world supply, although work with those lines was ineligible for NIH funding in the US because they were derived after August 9th, 2001. Turn, so fast forward a bit to, I think this will, oh, I just wanted to say that the work in this, this paper is based on two sources. Um, a chapter in my forthcoming book, Good Science, um, the chapter is called Science as a Vocation. It's taken from um, Max Weber's expression sci and essay, Science as a Vocation, um, Transnational Stem Cell Circuits. Um, and then um, Asian Biotech, which is, has just come out, edited by Iwa Ong and Nancy Chen. Um, and I have a chapter in that called Asian Regener Regeneration, Nationalism and Internationalism in Stem Cell Research in South Korea and Singapore. Um, Jennifer Liu also has a chapter in that, um, in that book. A wonderful chapter, actually. Um, so fast forward to um, March 2009. In a speech that accompanied President Obama's March 9, 2000, March 9, 2009 executive order, um, on relaxing restrictions on federal support for human embryonic stem cell research, the transnational uh, competitive logic was expressed as follows. And I want you to note all the rhetorical tropes used in this. Miracle, med medical miracles do not happen simply by accident. So first of all, we know that medical miracles happen. They result from painstaking and costly research, from years of lonely trial and error. Yeah, right, big science, lonely. Anyway, much of which never bears fruit, and from a government willing to support that work. From life-saving vaccines to pioneering cancer treatments to the sequencing of the human genome, that is the story of scientific progress in America. When government fails to make these investments, opportunities are missed. Promising avenues go unexplored. Some of our best scientists leave for other countries that will sponsor their work and those countries may surge ahead of ours in the advances that transform our lives. By doing this, in other words, by signing a presidential memorandum, um, directing the head of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to develop a strategy for restoring scientific, this is what the strategy was, was called, restoring scientific integrity to the government decision making. Um, we will ensure America's continued global leadership in scientific discoveries and technological breakthroughs. So in between these two rhetorical points, Bush's fueling of an international com competition and Obama's rhetorical resumption of the mantle of a global leader, stem cell research became seen in the US and elsewhere as a field where the usual hierarchies among scientific nations might be rearranged and around which new global biomedical research competitiveness might be built. So in this talk, then, I'm going to ask about where they were afraid that science was going. When people complained about the threats to international competitiveness and the risk of brain, da dra brain drain down regulatory gradients, it was not uncommon to hear certain Asian countries, along with the United Kingdom, named as the pull countries to Bush's push. An article in Business Week from January 2005, Asia is stem cell central, perfectly captured all these elements. Is just an excerpt from it. Singapore and others are racing to grab the lead in a promising field. Alan Coleman chose the city-state because of its tolerant climate for research using embryonic stem cells. The government has, has established a $600 million fund to invest in startups. Last year, Singapore opened Biopolis. Singapore isn't the only country in the region trying to profit from the US restrictions. The progress the Asians have made is astonishing. Still, Asian countries are, are far from assured of leading the way in stem cells over the long term. A lax approach to oversight and ethics in some labs, 
That's another increasingly important rhetorical trope that starts to enter and really picks up steam around stem cell and other kinds of medical tourism. Um, so a lax approach to oversight and ethics in some la labs, including the use of stem cells drawn from fetuses aborted in the second trimester in China. So again, China gets um, picked out as this particular rogue state um, and one that has this history um, of experimenting on the bodies of uh, prisoners and others uh, in what is implicitly set up as kind of a trajectory from Nuremberg to today that wouldn't be acceptable in this country. Um, bearing in mind that the US is, is, a, is a destination for medical tourism because in many cases it allows things that most other parts of the world don't, don't allow, such as egg donation and surrogacy and so on. Okay. Um, more worrying for the Asians is the growth in alternative sources of funding for stem cell research in the US. California approved Proposition 71. Seoul, for instance, has dished out a total of just 27 million. Singapore and other countries also pale in comparison to what California plan plans to spend. California may not be the only worry. Britain has a relatively liberal policy towards stem cell research. I don't think any one country can monopolize stem cell research, says Susan Lim, ch chairman of Stem Cell Technologies, a Singapore startup. California's research effort will attract attention, but Korea, Singapore, and China will be even more committed to pursuing it, says Huang Wu Suk. So what then was going on, um, as it were, on the ground in this Asia of the stem cell regulatory moment? So I carried out fieldwork in Seoul, South Korea, and in Singapore in 2005, and again in South Korea in 2008. Um, my original aim, and I've stayed in touch with many scholars since, I should say right away, and I do address this, but the, I'm in no way an ethnographer of any of, these reason, any of these regions. I am an ethnographer. I did ethnography in these countries. I did it within the framework of transnational comparative research. Um, and I'm acutely aware of the limitations of this kind of work. Um, if people have questions about that, I'm very happy to um, discuss it. My original aim in 2005 was to compare the flagship laboratories of the two countries' respective stem cell research efforts, Huang Wu Suk's laboratory in Korea, Korea and the newly constructed Biopolis in Singapore. These were the two places that were constantly mentioned as being the big destinations, the big locations that were threatening California, but in particular US stem cell research and by implication, scientific competitiveness in the US and rationality and modernity more generally. This was part of an, ab of an abiding interest in biomedicine as governance and in innovation as a propulsive force of globalization. So that's, those are interests that I've had throughout my, my um, work, uh, throughout my career. In the short term, I wanted to lay to rest an idea that was circulating at the time that put crudely, and it usually was, stem cell research was patterning in one way in the West because of Christianity's objections to the embryo destruction involved in deriving human embryonic stem cell lines, while stem cell research in the East was developing a pace in a re relative regulatory oasis because Eastern religions did not recognize the pre-implantation embryo as a person and saw cloning as akin to reincarnation. Um, those, that, those are uh, things that are taken directly from various scientists who were giving lectures at this time period, late 2004, 2005, 2006, um, making these arguments, including one that I won't mention by name, but the, the East had a statue of a large Buddha on, on the PowerPoint slide, while it was being explained that, that scientists didn't care about the embryo, as if there were no Christians, for example, in either of these countries. Um, and then the West was um, a, a combination of Christians who were stopping science and then these techno-Luddites who wanted to stop science, wanted to stop stem cell science because they thought it would ruin somehow back to nature, these, earthy, these earth mothers who wanted to stop it. So that um, the, Asia was portrayed as being this place that was um, a fantastic to go to and anything could be done there and, um, and thus as threatening US competitiveness, um, whereas the US was um, portrayed as, as strangling its own lead, its own role as a global leader because of its regulatory restrictions. 
Um, among the weaknesses of the explanation from religion, the account ignores the importance of Christianity in Asia, conflates Eastern religions, ignores the political and regulatory aspects of religion, such as efforts on the part of some East Asian stem cell ethicists to come up with Confucian ethical precepts to guide stem cell regulation. I'm referring there to Jennifer Liu's work, and sidelines politically enforced Confucian re revivalism. I don't need to tell anyone in this audience uh, what was wrong with, with those stereotypes. Um, the comparison, if it found variation within Asia, um, would suggest that, a, so, oh, sorry, so. So I'm gonna turn now um, to compare these two countries, Singapore and South Korea. And the point behind the comparison, if it found variation within Asia, would suggest that a more sophisticated analysis was required. If two Asian tigers were different, how could the entirety of Asia and the entirety of the West be accounted for by referring to Eastern versus Western religion? Once the Korean stem cell scandal broke, however, the comparison took on an addi additional aspect, familiar from science journalism, in attempting to account for the scandal. How why did this happen in South Korea as opposed to the United States or Singapore? And to what extent did it just happen in South Korea, given the ways in which uh, US scientists were also part of the lab enterprise and others? When I returned to Korea in 2008, it was apparent that the reasons for which Huang had risen and fallen were also symptoms of some key differences between South Korea and Singaporean stem cell research and to the complexity and regionality of Asia writ large. Okay, so I turn now to um, the comparison. So I, I went there wanting to, I went to visit both these labs, wanting to see if they were the same, if indeed there was something that was described by these as Eastern bioscience, that was being described in the US as Eastern bioscience. So this is kind of a summary slide for what I'm gonna, for the next part of this talk. So I turn first then to the South Korean laboratory, Hwang Woo Suk's laboratory. Hwang Woo Suk was a researcher and faculty member at Seoul National University, SNU. And um, as many of you may have followed some of his fate and may also have followed the fact that South Korea has recently restarted allowing human embryonic stem cell research. Um, SNU is considered the top university in South Korea in a country that valorizes education. It's notorious for pushing its students to excel in exams and its workforce for productivity, the two being seen as twin pillars of development. The summer of 2005 was the height of Hwang Woo-suk's fame in Korea and around the world for having reportedly succeeded in creating the world's first patient-specific human embryonic stem cell lines through the process of somatic cell nuclear transfer or therapeutic research cloning. So um, therapy, somat, the, the feat that he was, supposed, that he was reported to have com, uh, succeeded in carrying out was to take a single cell from a particular patient's body to, um, to uh, replace it with, to replace, enucleate it, replace its nucleus with a, a nucleus from an embryo and get it to start behaving like an embryonic stem cell, uh, like, a, like an embryo, like an embryonic stem cell and then to be able to isolate an embryonic stem cell line from that um, cell. It turned out, of course, as everyone knows, not to have been, in fact, not to have been what happened. Um, it was still a few months away, at the time it was still a few months away from his fall as it, was sub as it subsequently became known. First for revelations about the allegedly coercive practices of procur procuring eggs from women and then shortly thereafter for scientific fraud. During those months, Dr. Huang was one of a handful of the best known scientists in the world, mediagenic and possessed of an extraordinary knack for narrating his work in a manner that was both, both modest and charismatic. Who could not be seduced by the story of the hard work, Korean rural values, fame and honor from achievement rather than from being rich or a celebrity? And these, the interviews were everywhere, including all over the US press at the time with, with his, uh, his sayings and um, his, his approach to stem cell research. Not to mention his comprehensible and medically relevant scientific breakthroughs. In a time when the line between CEOs and scientists was becoming increasingly blurred in countries that were most aggressively adopting the innovation model in university life science departments, this was the kind of scientific hero that the world longed for again. And in a country where educational achievement and recognition abroad is a key currency of symbolic capital, Koreans themselves both envied and fervently promoted Huang. So these, I'm summarizing here my findings from um, ethnographic interviews. Um. 
Koreans themselves both envied and fervently promoted Huang in a campaign that culminated in the government's naming him Korea's supreme scientist. Even after Huang's disgrace over the following months, many Koreans, including Korean women who had volunteered to be egg donors for his research, continued to believe in and support Huang. Many abroad, myself included, also wanted his research to be vindicated as a rejoinder to the threat of corruption posed by the innovation model and as a decentering of an imperialist, West-centered, English-language-dominated economy of scientific research. Like others visiting Huang's lab, I felt privileged to be there and to be witnessing a great breakthrough. Despite his, and I was working with the California Institute for the Regenerative Medicine at the time, and I just can't overemphasize how, what a landmark achievement it was, the awe in which this man was held, um, and how it really did seem to be the beginning of, of, of a new world in, terms of, in the life sciences and the possibility of us all carrying in our bodies repair kits for our own bodies. So it's hard from, from the position that I was playing on, a, on the stem cell ethics committees and things at my home campus to overestimate how big this figure was um, to us at the time. Um, so despite his ascendancy, Huang was not entirely without critics in Korea at the time. In fact, several people mentioned the casualties of what one person described to me as the cult of Huang including the erasure of the contribution of his high-level collaborators, among them at least one prominent woman scientist who got little notice, and widespread envy of Huang for his rise as well as his funding success in what is widely taken to be a zero-sum Korean funding, science funding system. It's also interesting that people played it. So after the scandal broke, the US collaborators worked really, really hard to dissociate themselves from him after having been angry at first that he was getting all the fame um, and claimed that they had been kept in the dark about the ethical scandals and they would have pulled out much before if they had known that the, eggs weren't pro the egg donors weren't properly compensated and so on. Um, pride may come before a fall, but so too does envy. Likewise, the rumors about ethical lapses in egg procurement were already widespread and had reached me in California through my feminist networks before I left for Korea. The charismatic nationalism then was all-encompassing, all more in its emotional than its rational grip, and this in part accounts for its mythic exaggeration and the potential for fraud opened up by many parties wanting the phenomena to be real, um, including foreigners. Visitors entering Huang's lab were required to put on a protective, lightweight jumpsuit, jumpsuit over their clothes, to wear shoe covers, and to tuck hair into a scrub hat, as well as to pass through an airlock to decontaminate them. So even the visit, you waited for ages outside, then you were called, and you had to go through this intensive decontamination process. It's not entirely clear what functional value these protective practices held, apart from creating a general environment of care. The lab was designed such that visitors entered down a central hall, on one side of which was the human embryonic stem cell research, and the other side of which was the training facility where the team worked on porcine or pig ova, which they got from the um, you know, abattoir. The porcine, the pig side, was the one through which visitors toured. So you were having this cleansing thing happen to you before looking at bits of pig offal, essentially. Um, Visitors were encouraged to imagine an isomorphism between the side they were visiting and the human embryonic stem cell side by the symmetry of the layout and by screens on the walls on the human side, showing images of the work going on on the inside. It's not likely that anything being done on the porcine side would lead to human therapeutic biomaterials, cells that might be transplanted into a patient, for example, which might have made it important to protect tissue from contaminants carried by visitors. Nor is it likely that the petri dishes of pig eggs, embryos, and stem cells posed a risk to any of the humans in the lab. On my visit, the rigorous contamination standards reminded those of us touring of sterile medical facilities on the one hand, so I've done a lot of ethnography and surgery, for example, and it was very similar to that, except for the airlock, um, uh, which reminded many of us of silicon chip manufacturing on the other, suggesting perhaps some key genealogies. The difficulty and mode of entering also seemed to mark the esteem in which Huang and the lab were held. So Huang's chopstick pastoral. Once inside the facility, we were, taken around, we were taken around two adjoining rooms that together made up each of the stages of somatic cell nuclear transfer techniques and embryonic stem cell line derivation. The first station involved sorting and grossly preparing pig eggs, and the postdocs seated at that station literally had their hands in a large plastic basin of porcine ovarian material from the abattoir. 
Subsequent stations involve microscope and micromanipulation work, representing the different stages of fertilization, incubation, and derivation of stem cell lines. Taken together, the lab resembled an artisan's workshop with its apprentices in training, and they were referred to as apprentices. Our guide, a lab member, described the time and dedication necessary to master each step, citing six months as the time it might take to become good at a particular micromanipulation skill. So it was explicitly set up in these guild-like ways. No one could move on to the next skill until the previous one was mastered. The highest standards of care were taken with the materials at each stage, conferring a profound embodied sense of the potential value of the materials and the techniques as they were transforming them. This layout and these mores had deep resonances with the charismatic nationalist narrative of Huang, perpetuated by Huang himself and others in the media. Huang was already known for citing his rural livestock veterinarian roots and his rise from modest beginnings to supreme scientist. He credited the values of the Korean countryside with his work ethic in a prelapsarian bucolic narrative appealing to inhabitants of advanced capitalist cities, myself included. His work ethic, a stated readiness to work 365 days a year, night and day if need be, was expressed in terms of there being not a second to lose to find life-saving and life-altering cures, in contrast to the capitalist 24-7 work ethic compelled by profit and self-interest. Above all, he had famously made the statement that he and his colleagues had succeeded in deriving embryonic stem cell lines from patient-specific cloned embryos because of the national characteristics of the Koreans. Referring to the heavy metal chopsticks Koreans typically use to eat with and the slippery foods such as glass noodles they're required to pick up with these chopsticks, he was frequently quoted around the world for claiming that this conferred a superior degree of manual dexterity in the Korean population as a whole. As such, the break breakthrough in question, which required hitherto unattained manual skill, was naturalized to the Korean people. Huang's honor and glory was deflected from himself and onto the whole nation, only further fueling his rise. The ethos of care and the guild-like apprenticeship of the lab reflected and exemplified these values of sacrificial hard work and pastoral humility. At the same time, the evident hierarchy and the presence of non-Koreans from other Asian countries such as Bangladesh itself an interesting and important phenomenon, differing considerably from the kinds of science diasporas of Singapore's stem cell research, which I'll turn to in a minute, contradicted this picture. When I asked our guide about egg procurement allegations, his answer was evasive and non-committal, making it clear that for me to ask further would be disrespectful. First-in-class therapeutic proof of concept. The scientific payoff of Huang's lab was not primarily progress in basic cellular and molecular research, advancing understanding of pluripotency and regeneration, or the advancement of tissue engineering prowess. Rather, it was being the first to succeed in applying a difficult veterinary technique to human cells, namely, to get an enucleated human egg to begin dividing and differentiating after manually giving it the nuclear DNA from an individual afflicted with a condition in need of a cure. The promise of this technique was to be able to customize the DNA fingerprint of stem cell lines so as to treat individuals down the line with cells that bore their own DNA and so would not be rejected by the patient's immune system. While industrial scale-up seemed and still seems to be a daunting prospect, the therapeutic value was apparent. The technique known colloquially as therapeutic cloning is the one that has been introduced to the world in Dolly the Sheep almost a decade earlier. While Huang et al's results appeared to demonstrate that, that this procedure was possible in and viable for humans, um, well, what Huang, what Huang et al's results appeared to demonstrate was that this procedure was possible in and viable for humans, and that would have been a scientific first. Um, Huang's credentials for carrying out the work were emblemized by his success in cloning the world's first dog, an Afghan hound named Snuppy, for Seoul National University puppy. Dogs, like humans and other primates, have notoriously difficult reproductive endocrinology, and so the feat was considerable. That Huang's team should prevail in the race to clone human embryos and derive stem cells from them was plausible because of this existing expertise. Um, I'm just going to skip a little bit here. Huang et al's apparent achievement was personal and national, the promise therapeutic and universal, and the ethos one of humility with glory and meritocratic rather than economic success. This was a scientific priority race won by a charismatic scientist in university lab facilities rather than the basis for a biotech startup and the procurement of intellectual property. Once Huang's team attempted to extend the achievement beyond Korea to found a worldwide stem cell hub, the rest of the world resisted, 
and join Korean whistleblowers in uncovering the fraud that was exposed rapidly thereafter. And I can attest to that being on the ground again with the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine when he and his colleagues began to um, expand their idea of having a world of starting worldwide stem cell hubs around the world that were run through them, people absolutely rebelled. There was no way they were going to allow this Korean scientist to run or dictate what they were doing. And that was the po turning point at which everybody moved from absolutely loving him to wanting, as it were, to find his demise, wanting to bring about his demise. One US researcher who'd got his name on one of the, the suspect pub publications, despite perhaps having been less than a full co-author, scrambled to dissociate himself and also became the subject of an investigation at his home institution. Okay, so so much for Korea. The ethos, lab layout, and scientific goals, even the iconic animal, were radically diff different in Singapore at its um, key stem cell lab. So I turn now to Biopolis, One North Singapore. And people probably know One North is, is its, is its uh, geographic location and also is um, the kind of symbol around which a lot of the, uh, the call for um, economic activity um, circulates. The city-state of Singapore has been an independent republic since 1965, following brief periods of occupation, stewardship, or incorporation by Japan, Britain, and Malaysia, respectively. Since then, it has capitalized on the international potential of its English language, educational, and legal system, and dealt through intense social planning with extreme housing and land shortages. Biopolis is the name of phase one of a huge custom-built biomedical research facility, collectively known as One North, signifying Singapore's latitude and its aspirations to be a research and finance hub at the center of Southeast Asia. Biopolis was built at the turn of the new century and displays a degree of social planning at once continuous with pre-existing waves of social planning and yet radically new. When I visited in 2005, phase one of building had been completed and its buildings, Chromos, Helios, Centros, Genome, Matrix, Nanos, and Proteus, sound like the seven dwarves or something, don't they? were still being filled. Um, and filling them was, a, was, the, was the subject of a lot of uh, discussion in the US as well, US and, and the EU. Um, how is how Singapore, who and what are they going to fill those spaces with? Civic science real estate. Biopolis's newness for Singapore lies in part in the way in which it posits biomedical research as a way of life, somewhat as in a Silicon Valley company such as Google but without the Peter Pan syndrome. And um, that's a, another, a whole nother story about what's normal in the US. Um, one can get one's laundry done and socialize without leaving one's place of work. So as you all know, in the, some of these startup companies, most notably Google in the US in Silicon Valley, you're never supposed to be more than 100 yards from a cookie and there's daycare and laundry and so on on site uh, and you're, you get time off to do your own research and you're all supposed to be kept as youthful as possible so that you can keep innovating. Okay, so um, more significant uh, for my argument here though is the turn of the century mind meld between the public and private sectors that its physical structure posited. Two of Biopolis's seven buildings were occup are, are occupied by biomedical companies from the private sector, while the remaining five buildings are occupied by the various biomedical research institutes of Singapore's ASTAR, the Agency of Science, Technology and Research. The seven buildings are connected by sky bridges, making concrete the lofty connections between each unit. Similarly, all seven buildings share infrastructure in a basement and parking lot in a single foundation. A second aspect of the newness of Biopolis that's central to my argument here is its organizational structure. ASTAR oversees Biopolis, it falls under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, yet is made up of the Biomedical Research Council, the Science and Engineering Research Council, Exploit Technologies PTE Limited, the ASTAR Graduate Academy, and the Corporate Planning and Administration Division, mixing public and private, educational and corporate. Not very typical. And as ASTAR's very name suggests, it puts research together with as science, encompassing what it calls a full spectrum of R&D activities and graduate training. That academic training and scientific research and industrial R&D activities are seen as part of a single organizational entity stand, stood in contrast to the Korean case and stands to this day in contrast to the Korean case. This infrastructure for innovation has resulted in new areas for interdisciplinary biosciences research, 
of the five research institutes that make up the public part of Biopolis, the Bioinformatics Institute, the Bioprocessing Technology Institute, the Genome Institute of Singapore, the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology, and the Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. Four were formed at the turn of the century, the exception being another one which dates back, an older one that dates back to the mid-1980s. And A-Star states as its vision, a prosperous and vibrant Singapore built upon a knowledge-based economy, responsible for fostering world-class scientific research and talent for a vibrant, knowledge-based Singapore and made up of today's research scientists and future generations of aspiring scientists who dare to race with the world's best toward the very limits of modern science. Filling Biopolis, model species and international elite. So I was taken around Biopolis again. I tried to mirror the two experiences by one of the, the researchers there, um, just as I was at Huang's lab. Being shown around Biopolis was rather like getting a real estate tour, however, of an expensive new development, with the emphasis on filling the space with the right kinds of people. Unlike at Huang's lab, there were no sterility procedures. Instead, entry was regulated by security, and I was required to sign in to wear a badge while on the premises. So a little different than the surgical scrubs and the decontamination. I was signed in with my institution and a badge announcing who I was. The researcher showing me around emphasized the spaciousness, the layout that included the sky bridges and shared facilities, and the residents and research projects of the various lab spaces we visited. The most salient aspects of the tour concerned the residents, both animal and human, of the lab. High status researchers from overseas headed up many of the populated labs. So again, it was it, the, the personnel of the labs was in, a, in strong contrast to Europe, North America, and Asia were all represented as sending countries, and not all of these lab heads were in residence all year round, some managing to keep academic positions elsewhere while being involved with a lab at Biopolis. And indeed, a couple of the people that I was working with, I was at that time heading up the ethical and legal and social part of the Berkeley Stem Cell Center. Some of them had spent parts of their year in Biopolis. Singapore universities are famous for paying expatriates faculty higher salaries than nationals in a bid to lure faculty with international credentials and reputations. So the pattern of having foreign born and or trained heads of the labs had precedent. Most of the students, however, seemed to be from, from Singapore. Um, so again, in contrast to Korea. If Snuppy the cloned Afghan hound was the totem animal of Huang's lab and all it stood for, the zebrafish holds this position at Biopolis. The zebrafish is one of the world's most commonly used research animals because it's considered to be a good model of vertebrate development, including the basic biology of stem cell research. A species with a long history as a valued tropical fish in Singapore, the zebrafish became central to Singapore's research infrastructure in the early 1990s in fish farming research. Biopolis's massive zebrafish research facility was established in 2004 and had apparently taken a certain amount of trial and error to set up. It was still relatively new when I visited and was clearly a prize exhibit. The room was by far the largest model animal facility I've ever seen. Um, far from Huang's guild-like and heavily peopled lab, the zebrafish facility had no one in it when we visited except for us. And far from being told how the hoped for scientific achievements of this space would be made possible by the national characteristics of researchers, as occurred in Huang's lab, the zebrafish facility was explicitly organized to allow researchers to choose which international style of zebrafish maintenance they preferred. The fish tanks were organized into two sections, one kept in the American style, as they called it, and one in the German style, as they called it. I was told that there are two major schools of thought on establishing zebrafish populations for research. And the stereotypes behind these won't surprise you. The American one, which enables food, light, and temperature to be individually adjusted for each tank as part of the experimental conditions. And the German one, which standardizes food, water, and ambient temperature and light against which to measure experimental effects. And you know, it's all, you know, everybody who does ethnography is, is well aware of you. you, go, you, you can't, sometimes you can't believe how much things that you expect turn out. I mean, sometimes you get completely amazed, but sometimes these stereotypes play out in these ways that you wouldn't have thought were possible. 
after some joking about the stereotypes involved by, by the people from the lab who were showing us around, they, they were saying, as they were saying it, they caught themselves and they knew that there was an ethnographer. It wasn't just, they weren't just showing scientists around and I was going to be hanging with them for a while. So they, they became very reflect, they became self-conscious and reflective about it and um, joked about the stereotypes involved. Americans and endless choice versus Germans and standardization. My guide told me that this layout enabled them to appeal to major overseas researchers, no matter their preferences or country of training or origin. In other words, the zebrafish also displayed the international real estate for science and technology, design and organizational structure of the whole of Biopolis. While the ethics of human egg procurement dominated the unspoken space at Huang's lab, Biopolis suggested that foundational biological questions could be answered through research on model species. Neither individual charisma nor contested ethics was in evidence, even though many of the major figures behind Biopolis were important and well-known figures in Singapore society, and even though Singapore was actively in the process of writing and revising regulations to deal with the ethics stem cell research, in which I and many, many others um, had been communicated with regarding what was going on in other parts of the world. So like so many countries around the world at the time. Biopolis' stem cell research, a central part of its biomedical research activities, reflects its organizational structure. Our guide, an A-star researcher, told me that a full spectrum of stem cell research, not just human embryonic stem cell research, is, is encouraged, and that they are trying to benefit from having basic science research and translational and clinical re clinically relevant stem cell research all in the same site. In using the term spectrum to characterize Biopolis' fundamental approach to stem cell research, he echoed ASTAR's description of its research mandate as covering the full spectrum of R&D activities and graduate training. The recurrence of this metaphor during my visit was striking. Framing different kinds of research in different sectors by placing them on an imagined spectrum suggests that these activities and sectors naturally go together. This tends to obscure just how original and how unlike the situation in South Korea it is to place these elements together in this way and demonstrates that Biopolis' existence is original precisely for uniting these very elements. The use of the spectrum metaphor also suggests that the spectrum itself is the real payoff rather than lab results um, coming from a single point on the spectrum. At Biopolis, the various spectrums used to describe the place plot the parameters of the innovation hub being imagined. Not surprisingly then, when I tried to find out what researchers and administrators were hoping would be the scientific payoff of the stem cell activities at Biopolis, were there some goals equivalent to, Huang team, to the Huang team's attempts to make patient-specific stem cell lines, for example, the answers were more about generating innovation or at least producing a research environment indicative of innovation in general. A success would not be judged by sensational newsworthy feats, but more by productive teams led by the right people and working in synergy, whose output in publications and conferences would display the rapid growth patterns of the value-added location. The practice of successfully luring major figures from abroad was jovially referred to as serial kidnapping. And I, I was quoted, facts and figures indicating productivity, hub-like activity, such as the number of published reviews of research in a field, high concentrations of scientists in a subfield, and the hosting of major conferences, as well as percentages of the facilities in use. More than being the first to do something, the clinical relevance of which the public could understand, the three researchers I talked to uh, during, during my tour of Biopolis hoped to develop basic science research tools, such as a better understanding of the gene regulation of stem cell differentiation, that would be, feed, would be feed stuff for the on-site R&D chain and also positively reinforce on-site and Singapore, Singapore's knowledge infrastructure. So one is bench to bedside and one is a very different kind of, uh, of a, a spectrum. Singapore has set itself up as the central business and research and financial hub of Asia and beyond by seeking to recruit the most highly qualified international experts it can to train its youth while Korea has moved much more slowly to open up its faculty positions to foreign researchers and still sends a huge number of its elite students abroad to train. In the city-state of Singapore, business, education, research, and social planning are different facets of the same civic mission. At Biopolis, world-class stem cell and other biomedical researchers are training a young, largely Singaporean group of researchers to be the new citizens of its knowledge society. In Huang's lab, the emphasis was on the Koreanness of Huang himself, not on the lab's role in a knowledge society. In South Korea, much of the university research 
including most of the life sciences, falls under the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Technology, and is an additional area for dis arena for displaying national educational competitiveness as a developmental strategy, rather than part of the powerful private but state-protected industrial conglomerates that do most of the nation's R&D. The formation in 2008 under President Lee Myung-bak of the new Ministry of Knowledge Economy, the MKE, um, represents an aspiration to more effectively integrate older developmental nation state practices with newer calls for financial deregulation, globalization and innovation. The name of the new ministry is deceptive, however, as it replaces the older Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Energy and is still separate from the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Technology. Despite calls from some quarters to bring about a convergence between bio and information sciences and to move toward a knowledge society, university life science and translational biomedical research is harder to integrate into the knowledge econ economy in South Korea than in Singapore because that's not where it started. The protectionist and nationalist basis of its previous decades of economic growth is also harder to change. Only in 2008, with the establishment of the Ministry of Knowledge Economy, did South Korea change its policy to open up directorships of Korea's powerful research institutes to non-nationals. Even where both Singapore and South Korea reacted to similar global and regional trends by doing similar things, such as responding to the Asian financial crisis by moving somewhat away from high expenditure foreign export manufacturing um, toward value-added knowledge economies, bench-to-bedside biomedical research, such as stem cell research, played a different role in the two places. And I'm just going to move ahead a bit here. Um, so biomedical research, especially stem cell research, is a cornerstone of Singapore's efforts in this regard, while South Korea, later and less enthusiastic in this response in the first place, has relied more on transforming its already highly advanced information and communication technology sector to accommodate um, development demands, while stem cell research initially flourished in its national education system. South Korea produced and then participated in the emotional nationalist drama of the fall of its supreme scientist, in part because its university research labs are more part of its educational meritocracy, which has in turn been central to South Korea's development strategy, rather than part of its R&D sector. So the prize could have been glory. The then president of Seoul National University expressed after the fall of Hwang Woo-suk, most of us, in the name of national interests, exaggerated Dr. Huang's research to make it an aspiration of the nation. The prize of Singapore is its potential to be Asia's, if not the world's, easiest place to do business, that's a quote too, thanks to its stable legal, political, and economic environment. While Singapore has led the way in regional intellectual property law and finance reform, South Korea has been urged by the European Union and others to strengthen its intellectual property regimes. While Singapore continues to pay foreign faculty more than its nationals and to recruit superstars from prestigious universities overseas, South Korea saw one of its own nationals become a household name around the world and boast the most successful education system in the world. Both represent very different ways of being Asian tigers, very different Asias, and very different Asian bioscience. So this, this small ethnographic comparison shows that at the level of lab layout, um, mores in the lab, scientific strategies, and strengths and weaknesses of both sites, um, the, the country's histories and genealogies produce and sustain different, um, very different versions of biotech. Um, so science is everywhere and nowhere all at once. Yet anthropologists, sociologists, historians of science and science studies scholars have shown that there are profound regional and local differences in how the same science is enabled practiced and understood. In this spirit, this study compared and contrasted characteristic stem cell research and regenerative medicine facilities in two Asian tiger countries. I compared each lab's version of this small part of the biotech revolution, asking what it tells us about the nation in question, as well as what these nations' engagements with regenerative medicine add to our understanding of biotechnology, knowledge societies, and their significance. While there is no unified Asian biotech in evidence, each country's pattern is in stark contrast to the other in many respects. Both countries are operating within geographic, historical, and economic patterns that are importantly locally, located in and as Asia. So. Just then, by way of summary, there are many... I also went to several other Asian countries and other places as well that I don't have time to cover today, but even from the kind of research that I've been able to do, there are many stem cell Asias, many regenerative medicine Asias, um, including China, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, India, Japan, Thailand. 
um, each one of those and others is um, a major site and very different um, in all kinds of significant ways. Regeneration is it's not just regenerative medicine, but always at stake is regeneration of the genealogies that the practice itself comes out of, as well as regeneration of the body politic. Nationalisms are always also internationalisms and transnationalisms. There's always interconnections going on. Um, and regeneration of the genealogical nation and family is also always at stake. Um, if you um, recall back here, um, I had in comparing the two, the charismatic nationalist versus the international elite, um, the chopstick pastoral versus this. So if Levittown was the planned society of the nuclear age, um, this Biopolis is the planned society of the enucleated age. Enucleation is what they do for human embryonic stem cell research. Um, a high security lab with an apprenticeship versus an elite real estate with open facilities. A scientific diaspora through training and collaboration versus a, a lab where you, you hire and bring in, even on temporary contracts, people, high status people from abroad. Um, Snuppy, the difficult national veterinary achievement versus the zebrafish, the model species. And then these embryological one-off first in class um, goal that was the goal of, Huang, of Huang's lab versus the kind of all around excellence of um, this seamless spectrum of biotech R&D at Biopolis. Of course, I should also mention that people criticize, there are crit critics of both of these in, in both sites. Um, and I also wanted to say, it's very easy to look back now on the fall of Huang Wusuk, but it isn't at all evident, and it certainly wasn't evident at the time, which one of these would turn out to be the leader. Okay. Um, so, uh, so it's important to notice national innovation styles and difference in science funding regimes, um, and also that different re regulatory and ethical standards and pressure groups all in turn subject to pressures for international competitiveness and international so-called standardization and harmonization. So insofar as they are the same, it's quite a lot of that is part of a really explicit effort to bring about standardization and harmonization around the world, often inventing things that are particular to us locally, which we can then bring into standardization and harmonization with the rest of the world. So it's a very reiterative um, kind of process. And even when it seems to be most local and most nationalist, it's always engaging in these looping kinds of effects with transnational and international spaces. Um, and then finally, uh, some of you may know that Bob Edwards, uh, the IVF pioneer um, and the pioneer of the work that is kind of in the background for a lot of stem cell research, just won the Nobel Prize for Medicine. And he's, he features in my first book, these guys feature in my second, so I'm going to try and be, keep this winning streak up and hope that I, I'm picking, picking winners for the Nobel Prize. Um, but here's something from Time magazine from, from just a few days ago. Uh, I wanted to end us up with, with my point about the way that nationalisms, internationalisms, and transnationalisms link together. It's been a good week for advocates of stem cell research, both politically and scientifically. On Wednesday, an appellate court allowed the government to continue its funding of human embryonic stem cell studies after a judge halted this grant, these grants in August. And on Thursday, Derek Rossi, this is just last week, Derek Rossi and his colleagues announced a major leap forward with induced pluripotent stem cells, which don't come from embryos and can be, and can be generated from any type of cell, including skin cells. IPS cells were first created in 2006 by Shinya Yamanaka of Kyoto University and launched a flurry of excitement in regenerative medicine since they bypassed the political and moral challenges that face their embryo-derived cousins. So we're at a period where we're at the end of the beginning of stem cell research. It's increasingly looking likely that using embryos is becoming obsolete and unnecessary. At the same time, we're noticing that all along, these countries that were set up rhetorically around this pro-life issue were much more in interconnected than expected. So Yamanaka, who was the first person to succeed with induced pluripotency, stem cells without destroying embryos, is, in, is Japanese and working at a Japanese university, but did most of the research for that at the Gladstone Institute with, with, some, with, with all the CERN people in California. So there are really, really intense connections between Asia and the US all the way through this. And I'm guessing that uh, James Thompson, the guy who did the first um, stem cell line derivations, Yamanaka and Rossi will get a, a Nobel Prize for medicine in the years to come. Thank you for your attention.
I have a question about the, um, you pretty much talk about the micro level, yes. the ethnography of the two places, which was yes. just wonderful, of course. I'm curious about the, the other side you didn't talk as much about, the larger, the backdrop of the, uh, the yeah. development in those two places, yes. also in Asia in, in general, yeah. about the, um, the, rather than the dissimilarities, about the similarities, certainly there's a global need and demand for all this, and there's a niche for them to go into. Yeah. And at the same time, they uh, found this opportunity and uh, grabbed it and, and, uh, and went into even though uh, in spite of the local, very different local realities, that's how they pan out to be very rather different, right? And uh, so that's first part, part one about the, the larger backdrop, yeah. about yeah. the, especially those countries' uh, uh, interest in motivation as well to go into this. And uh, we know as a fact that in both uh, Singapore and uh, and uh, well, actually, multiple countries and China and mm -hmm, Japan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's been a drive in the 2000s in you know internationalized uh, higher education and science research in general. Yeah, yeah. So they take on different routes, different means to go there, right? And so uh, the the first part of the question is about the, the larger backdrop, mm -hmm. the, the, their own motivation of all this, about this you know getting there, put them on the map, world map. Mm -hmm. The second part is about the, what you studied and also the interplay mm -hmm. and how we got there, you know, the interplay between the, mic, the, the, the local and the, and the global, right? Yeah. How you know, each place took on different way, different mm -hmm. routes to get there. All right, thank you. Great, thank you for your um, wonderful questions. Um, so it, in, in the chapters that this is drawn from, um, I left out entirely the first half, which is kind of, summarizing my so the work that came up from interviews that I did where people mentioned historical I did I just did a lot of reading in general but where other scholars working on similar topics in Korea and Singapore and in the US and and EU on these topics they're writing also primary documents around this um, and then th things that people said in interviews that were directly to do with the economic context and the historical context forms the first part of, of this chapter um, uh, there were there were some things that came up a lot in interviews as well as in kind of background reading about the economics of the, of the two countries. Um, the Asian financial crisis was a real watershed moment in people talking in interviews as well as in, um, you know, that you, this need to reinvent, this need to move into something that, you know, where, that was perceived as being different around, under this name of, under this sign of knowledge society. Um, and that, so that um, came up uh, in, in both kinds of places. Um, a general shared uh, kind of uh, Asian tiger trajectory, but then radically different um, brought, you know, so in that, that kind of just since the end of the Second World War type, you know, in the last four decades or whatever type period, some things that are shared around export-led growth and so on in, in similarity, but radically different agricultural past, city-state with no land. You know, so your point is really well taken that there are some similarities temporally that link them and then some things that are just so radically different. But I was coming out of a context where this was the other and it was all go being portrayed as being Asia and Asia as the big threat for where biotech was, was going. Another thing that I address in this paper is Chineseness, which came up in both places, um, but it came up much less in Korea than people said it would. Now, it may be that I talked to the wrong people, and again, you know, I see some true experts of Korea in the audience who've done you know, de decades of research and ethnography who will be able to tell me whether or not my sample was representative or whether it was fluke. But the Chineseness that people said I would find, I did hear pe people did talk about it in the Singapore collection, but not so much in the Korean connection. And when it came up in Korea, it was more about uh, regional differences within Korea and um, Confucian versus Buddhist parts of the country and so on, more than anything, having anything to do with the sciences, whereas the kind of work ethic, biotech being connected to um, you know, startup activity in general and Chineseness in Singapore came up quite a bit. So again, I don't know if that's was more of a fluke, or if it's more, do you know that? I'm looking at you, but, or I look at John and Nancy up there, or Jin. If it's more of a fluke, or if, it, if that was, whether there's a reason why it came up less. But certainly the, um, yeah, this row of, of Korean experts out there, but certainly the, um, uh, you know, the, the, also the funding institutions, the this, this sense that in Korea there's a zero-sum 
Um, that came up a lot, that the funding for science is a zero-sum game. So if someone gets something, someone else doesn't. So if one gets the grant, some other lab doesn't get the grant. Or if, S if, if SNU gets the grant, some other place doesn't get it. Um, that came up quite a bit, um, which kind of le you know, really adds to the charismatic nationalist thing and is obviously a much larger economic issue to do with, with development strategies versus in Singapore, this kind of, we have no land, we have no agricultural anything, we have no kind of, um, the way, and it's not as kind of symbolic capital economy, but an economy where knowledge economy doesn't take space and we can, we can bring you know, people from abroad and get this whole kind of, although people worried in the Singapore case that they might never have a real breakthrough that they'd get a real recognition for. So you know, the tensions, the tensions were, were, were apparent. So definitely the, those larger macro things um, are, are behind every element of it. And, and in both cases, it was really explicitly articulated that, that biotech in general and regenerative medicine and then the interface between um, regenerative medicine, tissue culture, bioinformatics um, and informatics in general is going to be part, it's going to be what's going to propel the next phase of development and is going to keep people moving ahead. Could I just follow up on this uh, wonderful comment about uh, Karis quickly about Chineseness that you observed in difference in the Chinese yeah, observed yeah. in two places. Yeah. Uh, being an ethnic Chinese yeah. coming back from Korea, uh, 10 days ago I was at this national museum in, in Seoul, Korea. Yeah. It was fascinating for me to see that uh, uh, they uh, compared four histories from uh, uh, prehistory all the way to modern history, mm -hmm. four in parallel, uh, Egyptian and Greek, and then uh, in general Western, one line, mm -hmm. and Korean, mm -hmm. and Chinese, and, and Japanese, all right, four in parallel. Fascinating, the first ever uh, huge mural kind of a, a graph on the wall, okay. okay. And uh, in the, with that at the background, okay, then I began to see a lot of the things that were considered by the Chinese, the Chinese may not be Chinese uh, by the Koreans. Could be, you know, including Confucian, could be, you know, that could be a con uh, contentious as well. But, mm -hmm. but uh, that, that's probably not as much contentious as many other things that later on in the history, right? So, and, and uh, with that in mind, you probably see there's uh, quite a bit of a strong uh, sense of nationalism going on there, you know, try to describe history differently, which is yeah. fine, of course. You know, yeah. we all can de de describe history differently. Yeah. And uh, that's just one observation. And then a follow-up question on the differences, again, back to the difference in the micro, the uh, local level. Yeah. And to what extent do you see uh, language as either the barrier or the, uh, the, the chemistry there? In the case of uh, Singapore, for example, as I mentioned, uh, English has been used yeah. there as the global language, whereas uh, in, I think, in, in, Increasingly, it's been changing, although in both cases of uh, Korea and, and Japan, it's been a, a barrier, whereas in China, it's a little easier. I think that's the uh, one quick observation there. Okay. Yeah, so definitely in the Singapore case, just starting with the language thing first, there's the effort to capitalize on the English language speaking, um, you know, the lingua franca, as, we've, as we see around the world in a lot of... Uh, countries which have first or second language English really, really broadly distributed. Um, but, you know, it's not the career in some ways is, is I mean, they, they act really, really active too. We all have in our classrooms all around this country, countless numbers of Korean undergraduate and graduate students who, you know, went to language schools, those are growing, uh, and are coming to study in the US. It's just, so it's not that the language isn't really important there too, and speaking English is really important too, but it's just going in such a different trajectory. And in a way, that was exactly what was evident in the stem cell too. Sending researchers, sending students to the US, bringing this really interesting um, diaspora of people into Huang's lab. It was one of the really interesting things about it. There were people from parts of, of um, South Asia and Southeast Asia, who, and they were talking at the time, because at the time it was, that was the top lab, about how important they were just changing the geopolitics of science, that they were bringing these people from these countries that didn't have a shot at, at high level science ever before. You know, they would send their, keep sending their students to the US and, the, and Europe, but they were bringing people from countries like Bangladesh into their lab, and indeed I saw those people. So it was a kind of reverse diaspora. And um, so we're really, so English is still really important, but in a different, and a lot, and a lot of the, the researchers were conversing in English in Huang's lab because they had these other Asian, people in the lab 
um, on, the, on, these other, on these new diasporas. So it's trajectories that make sense, but, but both of them really, really importantly inflected with um, English. Um, with, and the language politics. And then, of course, for me, my almost complete lack of knowledge of, of Korean is a, was a colossal barrier to me to being a decent ethnographer there. Of course, I'm helped a lot by the fact that social scientists writing about the sciences, there's a major East, East Asian Journal of Science and Technology Studies, so a lot of people from um, Korea, um, uh, China, uh, Korea, Taiwan, um, Japan, and what am I missing? Uh, uh, are publishing in English, East Asian scholars working in East Asia, um, you know, are publishing in English. So at least in recent years, we've been able to, to um, consume scholarship, not just produced in the, in the US in English. Um, but it, and the other, the other advantage, and the other thing that meant that I was able to get more information than I might have been otherwise by my terrible language handicap is the fact that scientists in general speak English. It's the lingua franca of science, as well as being the lingua franca of higher education. But this question about the kind of genealogical and separating the different races, um, you know, until really recently, people thought that, you know, in the US, we do we, um, stem cell research. It's all about the future. It's all about hope. It's all about future. It's all about cures. And it's this kind of, um, the bio biopolitically, it's this kind of neoliberal subjecthood where you can, you know, if you have money, you can be part of, as they call the spitterati. You know, you can spit, you can get a buccal swab and get your genes all read for you, and it's gonna tell you, and you're gonna be a previvor, as they call it, so not a survivor, but a previvor. It sounds like something out of Philip K. Dick, that you can learn what's gonna be, how you're gonna get sick in the future, so you can get ready for it, you know, and so it was this very, had this kind of very hope-ridden, forward-looking temporality. But as that's coming closer together with um, the, uh, more genealogical uses of the research, of, um, of genomics and stem cell research, um, as the ancestry testing companies, which are mostly have been extremely active in, in um, US, among US ethnic populations, so-called, um, uh, Native American DNA testing, African American DNA testing, um, and as the forensic state becomes increasingly dependent upon, for its surveillance mechanisms, various kinds of biometrics that depend upon genomics and increasingly upon tissue culture techniques coming out of regenerative medicine, we're beginning to get um, a folding in of these different temporalities, including some that are about the body politic in general, including that are about the nation, how it defines itself, who's an insider, who's an outsider, who's a citizen and who's not. Um, and so we get, we're getting really characteristically US debates going on about the boundaries of the nation and who we need to separate from whom in the purposes of these biobanks and so on. Similarly to these are the populations that need to be distinguished in, in Korea, one from another. Thank you for your lovely questions. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed particularly the rich tropes that you used. Which, oh, thank uh, you. Um, but I wonder if they also perhaps lead us to emphasize more of the differences that are going on. And in particular, I was very interested in your question about the regeneration of the body politic. Yes. And your argument in Singapore about training of a new generation yeah. um, of Singaporean youth and bringing in these experts. Yeah. But it seems to me, I mean, I guess I'd like to know a little bit more ethnographically what's going on there. Because in that particular case, it seems that there's actually two tiers being set up. Mm -hmm. That the lesson that's being learned is that the value is in these foreign experts who are coming, whereas the local people are actually very much second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. So in terms of training of this new generation, mm -hmm. I wonder if that's actually going on in this case. And then likewise in the Korean case, mm -hmm. you talk about um, the lack of that kind of cultivation of a new generation. Mm -hmm. But then the workshop model that you discuss actually seems to be almost set up in a way where they're training these other cohorts of mm -hmm. younger scientists. Mm -hmm. But yet in the end, the result is the glorification of a single um, scientist at the helm and then the erasure of of the other people. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about what's going on ethnographically in this regeneration of the mm -hmm. body politic. Um, so Iwa Ong has, uh, is doing a long-term ethnographic study of the biosciences in Singapore, and you, I'm sure you're familiar with her work, um, which, which is um, you know, proving to be extremely interesting. But your, your question is, is excellent. Um, the, in, in general, um, the Singapore model, at least for the time that I was there in the interviews that I was able to do and tours I was able to do, um, they at least were emphasizing that they were training Singapore researchers, the middle level researchers were Singaporean citizens, 
um, and they at least hoped to make it in the business world and in the you know and in the political world um, as a result of these associations and the the, the kind of transfer of these trans of the cultural and um, social capital of these high status people that they were bringing in. But it was a very, very active debate, the question of, you know, how can we be a knowledge economy if we keep the two-tier salary structure? You know, why would you pay somebody who has a PhD from a different country more than you pay somebody who's trained here? It was a very active debate. So uh, the contradictions are exactly those, those that, you, that you point to, um, whether in fact you can, you can move into this kind of um, not, you know, real estate that doesn't require any real estate version of the knowledge economy um, in a way that doesn't separate the haves and have nots um, to in a way that some that they that the haves are all internationalized um, and in the korean state case a lot of a lot of uh, people were being trained but there's also this kind of continued um, at least again among the people that I was talking with if your kids say is really good in school maybe they will go to the US for college and maybe they'll come back, back and work for Samsung I mean it just still was that kind of sense of um, that these that the trajectories for the elite at, could be marked by educational attainment and educational success particularly exam success and that they, those had trammels that didn't necessarily run through the life sciences in the same way and so if, if the life sciences were going to be a, an important part of these new knowledge economies it was going to take some work and especially if they were going to come out of the, the educational enterprise how then do you map them more onto these other places so yeah, I mean you're absolutely right thank you maybe one more question hello um, thank you Dr. Thompson for the talk so you talk about the um, how the differences of the transnational heterogeneity in um, the practice of stem cell research, how it is played out in laboratory cultures between the two places, and how it is connected to the different picture of national imaginaries. Mm -hmm. I think that is very interesting. But I wonder if there is also a substantial uh, spectrum of dissimilarities on laboratories within each country. Oh, course, yeah. And how does this um, different scale of differences on laboratory cultures play out in your generalization and comparison between the two places. So for example, yeah. we all know that uh, Singapore is so much smaller than South yeah. Korea. Yeah. And um, does this different um, scale of different, a scale of differences on laboratory cultures yeah. make it more, let's say, difficult, for example, I don't know, um, to generalize from the Korean case as opposed to the Singapore, Singapore case? Yeah. Um, thank you. Another excellent question. Um, so. Uh, the way that I set it up, which, I, which probably is, is problematic, um, was that if I could find significant difference in these two flagship laboratories, the one that, ones that at the time everybody was talking about, and that everybody was scared, that represented the suck points for the brain drain that was being imagined from this end as going on, and represented those places that were going to produce the knowledge that was going to n topple US supremacy, um, so it's very much from a US perspective that, uh, as I tried to say right at the beginning, and that's of course a big limitation um, to my work, and luckily there are people who uh, not, don't have such limitations working in the field. Um, but, but, you know, within Korea there's lots of, I mean, there's tons of really, really industrialized and really pushing ahead knowledge society life sciences going on. Um, so, you know, that's, that's true, but it wasn't, they, those weren't at the time and still aren't the flagship stem cell places. So this, this, um, this field that, was, that seemed to be able to de describe the body politic biologically, to repair and offer this biomedical promise that um, a lot of countries around the world were really jumping into, um, wasn't being answered in those spaces. They became actually, and a lot of the Korean um, laboratories were work, um, areas were working more like the Singapore case in organizing conferences, you know, you go to this island and you have a nice conference and then you go home to your parts of the world um, and such like. But, but what, for, the, for the point that I wanted to make, I wanted to make the point that, there, that there's not one Asia in stem cell research. Even the labs that they imagine are radically different. They're not, you know, they're not one Asia. Um, and uh, that... Um, that uh, 
stem cell research is going to, going to develop in, in the whole part, part that I missed out from the beginning of this chapter is about why stem cell research, why it's so interesting. And it's so interesting, I think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think it's so interesting because it is the convergence of information technologies, informatics, medicine, and tissue and regenerative you know, um, repair. So it's, it's, and it's also highly, highly capitalized. So always already it's going to describe the nation, it's going to keep out the wrong people and bring in, let in the right people, and it's going to be a development strategy. And all around the world, those things are kind of in common, um, including here, really, really dramatically here as well. Um, and then, so Asia became this fictive other for the, in this moment that, um, and, in, and now we're in this point where, um, you know, Obama just announced that, you know, we, we no longer have to send our people there, but then a, few, a couple of months ago, we were all up in, fear, in arms again because the Dickie, Dickie Wicker meant that this judge threw out the Obama um, licensing of federal funding for stem cell research. Um, and, you know, the fears started a little bit again, but, but, but the other interesting thing is that underlying this, people are moving between each other's labs. You know, Yamanaka, I mean, he's an amazing guy. And when he gives a lecture, I think you've interviewed him, right? Have you? I don't know. Anyway, when he, when he gives lectures, you know, he kind of stands there and says, well, I don't know why I'm so famous. And I mean, and again, he's kind of enacting a trope of modesty, which, you know, of humility, which should be taken with all good, you know, with, with a pin huge pinch of salt. But nonetheless, he's kind of standing there saying, you know, here I was at the Gladstone Institute, and to be honest, the money ran out, so I went back to Japan, and the most prestigious places wouldn't have me, so I shacked up at such and such a place, and then finally Kyoto let me open a lab, and no one would work with me. I got the fifth pick of graduate students, and then one of those graduate students and I happened to find that, you know, we, with, these, with these few, you know, if we, we could introduce these oncogenes, and we, this, you know, we could make this, we could um, induce the pluripotency just by expressing these particular fa factors. Um, which became the basis for, for the new breakthrough from last week of the messenger RNA work that Rossi's team has done at Harvard. So underlying all this is a lot of kind of happenstance and a lot of traveling back and forth between labs and hierarchies of whose lab is good and whose lab is bad and who gets what job where that's going on in all these countries and has its own sort of inst educational institutional logic that has nothing to do with the kind of story that I'm telling here. And, and in, in a way that makes my story wrong, but... Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Okay.